Thank you, Maharaj, for joining today for the Monks podcast. Now, in the past, we have discussed several contemporarily uh, volatile issues. So I thought we could continue that tradition today. And <laughs> we could discuss an issue that is very prominent in the media now, in the news, that say the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. And uh, broadly, since you have written, a uh, spoken, written extensively on the Mahabharat, uh, I thought we could take this, you have also the quest for dharma, that uh, quest for justice, you have written that book also. So, you know, today's wars, how much are they comparable with, say, the wars in the epics like the Mahabharat? So one attitude could be that those are fought for transcendental purposes, and today's wars are fought for mundane purposes. So... We have no parallel, but if you say no parallel, then there's very little we can learn from those wars. Uh, I wouldn't say there's no parallel. Okay. Uh, I think we have to take a realistic and not an idealistic view of what was actually going on back then. When uh, when Krishna appeared, let's say 5,000 years ago, and there are other avatars, but let's focus on the situation 5,000 years ago, roughly. Hmm. Uh, those were special times. There were special asuras, demonic forces on earth that normally would not be there in such strength and numbers. And there were they were countered by special godly forces, devas and uh, and the great Bhagavatas and so on. And then Krishna himself came. Hmm. So we also have to read we have to recall that we have evidence in the Bhagavad Gita that Vedic culture, if we want to use that term, uh, goes through boom-bust cycles. Boom bust. So, for example, Krishna declares in the Gita, everyone knows this first, yada yada hi dharma that whenever virtue, justice, is declining and avyutanam, and there's sort of a uh, an aggressive rise. That's why I translate avyutanam, an aggressive rise of adharma injustice. Tada! Then atman sujami, how I manifest myself. So, I mean, sujami, you could, you could also translate literally, I unleash myself on the world. And so, okay, yeah. So there, there are different meanings for that verb, but in any case. Um, so Krishna tells Arjun that Sakale Neha Mahatad Yoga Nashta Parantapa, that, that uh, the spiritual science or even Dharma have declined. And so, and Krishna says, Yada Yada, whenever. I mean, surely he's not just referring to every bad Kali Yuga. So that means Krishna is talking about ages, historical ages, long before 5,000 years ago. And he says, whenever, which means it happens. When Krishna says, whenever Dharma declines, that means it happens. So sometimes we tend to take this sort of very idealistic view, but in, in, in the real world, there are boom-bust cycles. You know, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. To give an example, the Mahabharata tells about Orva, who was uh, this sage who became, as a child, he became very angry because the Kshatriyas were slaughtering the Brahmins. And so there was conflicts because the Brahmins were accused of hoarding wealth and not sharing it with the kings. I mean, whatever was really going on there was violent conflict between Kshatriyas and Brahmins. So, so this idealistic picture where the Brahmins and Kshatriyas always cooperate together, yes, when, when the system was working well, it, it, it was like that. But periodically, it didn't work well. And further, if, if you look at, say, we have to remember that the situation in Afghanistan was a direct uh, response to 9-11 in which, you know, the whole country, America, was sort of in a, in a, it was traumatized. And so in ancient India, if some people came in and just blew up or, you know, slaughtered a lot of innocent people, yeah, there would be a response. 
you know, if the king was capable, he would march on the enemy, whoever did that, and, and there would be hell to pay. So we shouldn't think that everyone back then was just acting for the loftiest spiritual motives. I mean, there was law and order, and there was crime and punishment. And, and if you look at the Dharma Shastras, say Manu Smriti, or just, you know, there's so many Dharma Shastras, so many law books, you know, very little of it is talking about transcendence. It's talking about down-to-earth human crime and punishment. It talks about, uh, you know, how, how human beings should marry, because, anyways, so many things. Yeah. So, so... Yeah, so we shouldn't falsely think that, unlike today, back then, everyone was a devoted transcendentalist. Yes, Maharaj, that, that, is, uh, that is true. I mean, most, if, when Krishna also talks about, if you see the context when Krishna is besieged, Kamsa is performing atrocities. And uh, so, in some ways, Dharma does refer to more of social law order than. Uh, Dharma, Dharma, yeah. Dharma is a word for justice. Justice, okay. So it's not so much uh, like uh, the legislation of faith. That, no, in that sense. no, 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 no. That's uh, translating Dharma as a sectarian religion, a sectarian in the sense that you make specific claims. If you look at the Mahabharata, for example, or the Bhagavatam, one thing which amazingly is not present as far as I can tell, anywhere in the Bhagavatam or Mahabharata is a religious institution. Yes. So when you think of Dharma meant the law, for example, uh, for example, we have this uh, belief nowadays that everyone's equal. And of course, there are some ways in which people are equal, and there are obviously some ways in which people are not equal. Mm -hmm. So but that's a metaphysical claim. That's not an empirical claim. So we claim that in a just society, in a society that promotes justice, um, there should be equal justice under the law. That's metaphysical. So is that religious? No one thinks that democracy is based on a religious claim, but it is. So democracy is it is not a let's say just the belief that a type of uh, utilitarian belief that we should promote the greatest good for the greatest number of people and therefore let's use social science, psychology, economics, and uh, neurology and and everything and let's try to build a society which brings the greatest happiness to the greatest number of people. Um, it, what if it turned out that democracy doesn't do that? Of course, no one's willing to even talk about that. There, there are no serious discussions about that. Everyone just says, well, democracy is not very good, but it's history. It, it's the best system that, that we've ever seen in history. And of course, the people that say that, generally what they all have in common is they've never seriously studied history. Oh, So, so it's just... Like, so, wait, wait, sorry. Yeah. So when you said that <laughs> democracy is a religious, uh, democracy is based on a religious claim, you are using the word religious in the sense of well, metaphysical, I mean, that metaphysical. there's no way we can empirically demonstrate everyone's equality. It's more of a conception or intuition that we human beings have. It's a metaphysical intuition. Now, Krishna and the Gita speaks very strongly about our equality but in a special sense. It's not an equality that destroys hierarchy because if, if you destroy hierarchy, it leads to chaos, and then generally you get tyranny. So generally, when you, when, you, when you try to smash hierarchies, you generally get worse hierarchies. But anyway, uh, so... That's, um, a very strike, sorry, that's a very striking point, that today's equality rather than focusing more on gaining equality, focuses on destroying hierarchy. And yeah. So, yeah. Yes, and, um, but, it, but it, it's, I mean, Thomas Jefferson in the DOI, the Declaration of Independence, 
he he stated that he and his fellow authors that it's um we hold these truths to be self-evident that people are created equal, created and down by the creator. So Thomas Jefferson directly uh, bases his theory of democracy on a, you could say, a, a religious fact or a metaphysical fact, because if you say there's a creator and the creator has given us certain rights and therefore no king, no tyrant can take those rights away because they're given by the creator. That was the point. And so that, you know, it may not be a sectarian religious claim, but I think it's arguably a religious claim. So if you take away the goose that laid the golden egg, if you take away a creator, then, and you say we're equal, what does that even mean? We live in a time when uh, thinking is really an endangered activity. I mean, people don't think. And so everyone says, okay, we're equal, but how do you know that's true? That's my simple question. You say we're all equal. How do you know that? Empirically, you can't prove it. So how do you know it? True. So Maharaj, this idea of the inherent equality of people as you could say a political right, are there some parallels to that in the Vedic tradition also? We yes. understand the Bhagavad Gita acknowledges the free will of the living. Yes, people. yes. Yeah, where Krishna says, Samohang Sarva Bhuteshu. Every king or every leader is representing God. And if they don't, then they're probably going to just make a big mess. And there are many pseudo religious leaders who do make a big mess because they have no idea what God really is. And they have no idea how to represent God, even though they flaunt their religiosity. So. The point is, if Krishna, if God says, I'm equal to everyone, what right do you have not to be equal to everyone? And so, um, yeah, so the Bhagavad Gita teaches that every living being has to be seen as a divine soul. Okay. Because generally, whenever Indian, Indian social structures are talked about, the caste system is talked about and a hierarchy is talked about, and that, that is said to lead to discrimination. So what you are saying is that... Well, that is, is that, it, 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 but is it discrimination that certain people get into IIT and some people don't? That's the Indian Institute of Technology. Yes. Okay. Is it discrimination that so certain people, let's say, succeed in athletic competitions, other people lose? Hmm. Is, is that... There so are we, different... Yes, so we could say that the caste system is like a meritocracy, but considering yes. previous lives also. In today's meritocracy, we just focus on, okay, this life, and that's why... Well, somebody- really, I don't think the past life really matters, I mean, I mean, for this context, because let's say I go to a doctor. Prabhupada gave this example. He said, if you know, doctors mm. are designated by hereditary right, then you're going to get some really, really bad medical programs. And so um, if someone is a competent doctor, if I go to a dentist or a doctor and they're he or she is just really good at what they do, I mean, I don't care what their past lives are. I don't care what their religion is. I just want a good doctor. You know, when you want a good doctor, you really want a good doctor. Yes, Mara, and, that's true. I, I, that point is perfectly uh, well taken. But it does seem the way society was in India, a person was largely presumed that if you're born in a Brahmana family, you will be a Brahmana. If that person does some egregious activities, then they may become a Brahma Bandhu. So conversely, if somebody is born in a Shudra family, if they exhibit some exceptional qualities, then they could be considered to be a part of another Varana. So in one sense, uh, equality as conceived in, in the modern context, Equality as a political right, uh, that may not have been there, but equality as a as a principle, which was institution, which was instantiated in a different way, is there in Varanashram. Yes, and uh, but also everyone had equal right, for example, to protection from a king. Whether you, whether you were a very humble member of society or elite, you had a right. Okay to protect it. You had a right to live in peace. 
Yeah. So we have example of Ranti Dev and Shibi. Even non-human livings are going to the king, and the king is able to sacrifice himself for his own bodily yeah. parts and his own personal comforts for the welfare. So that is a very striking example. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, Pandita Samadarshana. Yes. Why see everyone equally? So Maharaj, uh, going back well, to Afghanistan, should we get back to poor Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah, of course. I was going to I was going to get back there itself. So and why we came, why we discussed about equality is one on one perspective, the fight over Afghanistan was to say in, set up democracy and bring uh, the Afghan society and culture in some way in conformity with what was there in the West. But you yeah, started also, from another I mean, perspective. I mean, I mean, sorry, there was, also, there was also yeah, there was also a punitive aspect of it. Yeah, for that's what you mentioned that in that 9/11 was a outright terrorist attack and any government has to take punitive action over there. So, and now exter externally speaking, uh, the maintenance of law and order uh, for one country in another part of the world, which is a very remote and different part of the world. So we know Yudhishthir was said to be the world emperor and there were many states or we can say kingdoms within him. So how much was the the governance during the Mahabharat times centralized or decentralized? In one sense, for America to legislate, Afghanistan was always... Yeah, but, but then again, you see, I think, I think what we're forgetting here is that um, I think the general rule in political history hmm. is that political entities tend to amalgamate to the extent that the current technology allows it. That's so, okay. Yeah, so for example, uh, well, well, Yudhisthir became Raja Raja, uh, you know, king of kings, and uh, and other people before him had held that position. Vasu of Chedi held that position. That's another story. He was four generations before Krishna, where imperial power was transferred from Hastinapur to Shukti Mati, the capital of Chedi. But in any case, um, I mean, take the United States. The United States, if, if we can put aside, and, and I don't mean put it aside as a moral consideration, but just put it aside so that we can, we can put aside slavery just for the moment so that we can just talk about political philosophy. Yes. Uh, as the Constitution was being written, there was a great debate going on in America, uh, which was eventually published as the Federalist Papers. Yes. And I basically, know. yeah, basically, there was one group represented by Alexander Hamilton and uh, James Madison was very brilliant, wrote a lot of the Constitution. And they were saying that for America to survive, it must be a federation, which means that power is in the center, originates in the center, and then power is distributed or delegated regionally from the center. And the other view was confederation, which means that power originally and primarily resides in the various members of this confederation, and they delegate power to the center. Okay. As opposed to the center delegating power to the perimeter. And to give one example, uh, the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley is a confederation because the power is in the members and they delegate power to the center, which is the GTU. So anyway, th this was a big political debate. So eventually, of course, they had a civil war over it. And there, obviously there were other issues involved like slavery. But um, so if you look at India, I mean, India is an empire because if you look at Gujarat, I mean, the very name Gujarat and Maha Rastra, they were, you know, for thousands of years, these were kingdoms. And mm. isn't that, I mean, Tamil Nadu, they're fiercely proud of their own regional, I mean, you know, they had they had their own little mini empires. Yes. And um, so the idea that Maharashtra, Gujarat, Punjab, 
Uh, you know, just go down the list, all, you know, the four states in southern India, <clears throat> Tamil Nadu and uh, Kerala, Karnataka and Andhra. Well, now there's five, actually. Yeah. Andhra, you know, West Bengal and all these things. The idea that these are states in a country, that's an empire. I mean, there is in India an empire with its capital in, in, in Delhi. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying okay. it is. I mean, it's a fact. And so, so if you... So you're saying India functionally is more like a confederation, although technically, legally, it might be a federation. Well, but, the center still has a lot of power. Yeah, of course. That, but, but, but So here's my, here's my point. Yeah. If we look at world history, we find all different levels and sizes of political unification. For example, you find city-states such as in Italy, Italy yes. it went to its political opposite. The Romans were the great unifiers and team builders and imperialists. And then you get the equal and opposite reaction, you know, this atomization of Italy into these little city states. So, so from the point of view of the city states, Italy as a country is an imposition. If you look at Germany, there, there were so many, if you look at a, 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 a a map of Germany before the German unification in the, in the second part of the 19th century, there were just dozens and dozens of little principalities. And many of them resisted unification because they thought it was imperialism. So, so you, you can get much smaller sizes of political entities, city-states or little regional, you know, little kingdoms. And some of the kingdoms in the Mahabharata were very small. By our standards, you know, you could drive a car across them probably in an hour. And, 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 and so you, you know, or two hours. And so you get these, and then you get larger entities. Hmm. You get, you know, nationally, you get nationalism. Nationalism, at least in many countries in Europe, was a movement which kind of rejected the freedom and independence of all these ancient principalities and insisted, no, you're just a member of a larger entity. And so, so then what I mean to say is in order to control a political entity, in order to control a state, and I don't mean like American states, I mean a political entity. Yeah. In order to control it, you have to have certain levels of communication. Uh, you have to be able to uh, deploy. You have to be able to um, force you have to be able to manifest force. That's why the Romans, one of the first things they did when they went into a new place and conquered is they built great roads and bridges. Hmm. Because if you want to, uh, you know, extend your power, you have to be able to technically do it. And and so... Um, that's why I think so, the British also made railways in India. Oh, absolutely. They made, they made railways, and that's why they were so deeply committed to naval technology. Oh, naval. Okay, yeah. Just to get to these faraway places. So okay. if you project, if you want to project power, there, there's all this, there's a lot of engineering required to project power. And so nowadays, when we have so much more technology, power can be projected over much larger areas. And plus, if you look at the earlier world, uh, people in remote parts of the world never really had anything to do with each other. But now with international commerce, I mean, I mean, it's a general principle that people who are regularly interacting and affecting each other, there are two choices. Either it's just the law of the jungle or that that relationship, that interactive relationship be regulated by reasonable laws. Okay. And so, and so because the level of global interaction has exponentially increased, the level of global interaction has exponentially increased, therefore there's a greater and greater need for international law or for United Nations and so on. And so, and so therefore political size, you know, the size of, and, and so when you say, you could ask the question, you know, what is the most legitimate size 
for a sovereign state? Is it the city state? How do you justify, uh, let's say, political sovereignty that uh, includes many cities and therefore strips city states of their power? I mean, you saw this very clearly when the Romans took over the Greek world. Because, I mean, especially before Alexander, I mean, Alexander was kind of a, you know, one of a kind phenomenon. But if you look before Alexander the Great, you know, for whom God only knows how many centuries, Athens was a state. Hmm. Sparta was a state. You know, Thebes and, and, and you know, all these different, and, and of course, uh, Oh, what's that little city on the anyway? Anyway, there's so many of them, and 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 not to speak of what is now northeast Greece, you know, Thess- Thessaloniki, which was like you know, or Macedonia, and and so on and so forth. All the islands were were states, independent states, and so sometimes, of course, they were forced into alliances, like with the Peloponnesian War. But basically, for the Greeks, the basic reality, the basic basic political legitimacy. Fundamental sovereignty was the city-state. And then Rome came along and, and just sort of swallowed it all up. And so, so even the modern city of Greece, a country, the modern country of Greece, is, is a radical departure from the way the Greek world operated for many, many, many centuries. I mean, the idea that Athens or 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 Sparta. Now, anyway, so what I mean to say is on what grounds, on what if this is my question, then I'll turn it over to you. As I hear, I'm hijacking your program. But right. so my question to you would be, on what rational grounds, on what objective grounds do you say that the city state or just the regional state or the nation state, which was kind of a, a later invention, you know, the nation state or the empire or an international coalition, on what objective grounds do you say that this size, this size and level of political amalgamation, or this size of sovereignty, is somehow objectively more legitimate. That's the way things should be. What's the criteria there? Yeah, I think that's a complex question. I think one would be pragmatic, whatever works. And like earlier, you talked about technology. That if you have, well, the yeah, 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 whatever, mm-hmm. wherever you have technology. Whatever technology we may have, uh, based on that, it will work. Now, if I understand right, in the Mahabharat, it, it even when Yudhishthira was the ruler, it seems more along a confederation, because there seem to be independent kings, and uh, it's only uh, when... I, I, I would say it's in between because it's in between a federation and confederation. Because if you look at Yudhishthira, for example, as an emperor, there's no evidence anywhere that Yudhisthira interfered with the internal management of any country. And, hmm. and, and each country did have its own flag, by the way. And so, and even after, even post, even post Kurukshetra, hmm. after the battle of Kurukshetra, where the world was just really changed forever. I mean, the way the world is today, it's still the consequences of Kurukshetra, which is an interesting topic. Oh, really? Okay. But in any case, what what did Yudhisthira do as the emperor, so-called as the Samrat, the emperor? He sent his brothers again for the second time in the four directions. It's very convenient for four directions, four brothers. Okay. So he sent them out. And um, basically, the demand was that they acknowledge Yudhisthira as the central authority, and basically they pay their fair share to maintain a central military force that could protect weaker kingdoms from stronger ones and and just ensure justice. There's no indication anywhere that Yudhisthira or his brothers got involved in the internal management. I mean, it's not that Arjun, for example, who went, I think, to the West, 
It's not that our because because he, he went to sin, the sin yeah. do, sin do. It's not that it's not that our June said, okay, I want to see your books. You know, I want to talk to your finance minister. And from now on, you know, before you make any decisions in terms of how you manage your kingdom, I want you to first, you know, get it authorized by you. There's nothing like that. Yeah. Basically, you know, there's Dharma, follow Dharma, pay your federal taxes. That's what the tribute was. It was federal taxes because you need a, you need a federal army. And um, and that's it. Yes, my that seems... I think even when Krishna goes and kills uh, demons like uh, uh, demo demoniac kings, it's not that he he installs Yadus as kings over there. He usually exactly. replaces the king and finds a virtuous son. Who yes, just like, with, like, like when Jarasandha was killed, Sahadev. Sahadev, yeah. Even Lord Ram does that in the Ramayana. Lanka, he doesn't annex. He makes Vibhishan the king. Yes. So, yes. so this also seems to indicate that Black and white was not genealogical in one sense. Like, no, you can't. You can't go with the Hollywood version of political theory. The Hollywood version of political theory is that empires are always bad and democracy is always good. Let me give you an example. In the century um, before Christ, Rome, the Roman was was. Uh, suffering from just a series of civil wars. And to some extent, it was because of a very bad decision the Roman Senate made. Normally, the system was that the kings, the, the generals would go out, they'd take their Roman legions, they would fight for Rome, and then Rome would, you know, pay them. But then they had this really bad idea that rather than Rome having to pay uh the generals would pay their own troops, which would motivate the generals to win battles and get a lot of booty. And so what happened is soldiers started becoming loyal to their generals, not to Rome. And therefore, you had all these warlords that descended on Rome and tried to take over. And so and so the century before Jesus in, in, in the Roman uh, world is really a century of uh, civil wars between warlords. Hmm. And it was pretty miserable. And it, and of course, because they had this empire dragged everyone in. So the world was just constantly being, it was a really bad situation. So finally, one of the top Roman generals decided enough. I'm going to stop all this. I'm going to stop these civil wars. And so he marched into Rome and, 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 and took over to stop all the civil wars. And of course, his name was Julius Caesar. Oh, okay. But in any case... Okay. But I won't go. In, I mean, he's an interesting figure. I won't go into the details of his life. But in any case, when he was assassinated, um, his adopted son uh, became the emperor, imperatore. They use the term imperatore because you couldn't use the word king because the Romans wouldn't accept a king. So imperatore is more like the administrator. But of course, it took on historically a very different meaning. But in any case, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of what I find to be interesting historical details. But in any case, the point is that Augustus Caesar established what was called in Latin the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. All the civil wars ended, all the regional wars ended. And basically, just like in America, let's say, if you, you know, for the most part, you can travel all over the country like I'm doing. And it's the same, you know, basic laws and the same rules and everything. And you're not really in great fear. If you stay out of certain neighborhoods, you know, you're not really in serious fear for your life. And so it was a Pax Romana. So you could argue that when uh, Augustus Caesar took over, hmm. life became much better for most people. Now, that's not, you know, Hollywood version is, you know, empires are always evil. Okay. And so, and, and I think that's sort of a comic book Hollywood version of things. But, you know, sometimes they're evil and sometimes they're not. So you have to look, you have to actually study history. You can't just, you know. Yes. Yeah, uh, so. So, uh, so I think I was just. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So now regarding the Afghanistan issue, 
you know yes. so why is it such a matter of concern i think we discussed two things till now one is the law and order issue and the that there is a more you could say they they becoming a terror state that will sponsor terror all over the world which is what had happened uh, in I, think, I think that's i i mean obviously that's not impossible yeah i it would surprise me i mean i've been surprised before because I think what they've seen is that if they do start sponsoring terrorism, that there are going to be very, very severe consequences. And so, um, yes, so sir. as far as we will, sponsoring, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Sorry, we will discuss the issues, but I just trying to outline the issues. What are the issues of concern? One is that they may create trouble across the world, as had happened in some ways in 9/11, and India is geographically much closer to Afghanistan. So in India also, there is a lot of concern that uh, Pakistan may use Afghanistan as a to continue its proxy war against India. So one is the yes. disruption of law and order. The second is uh, the what they wanted to create a more modern state in terms of democracy and human rights as envisioned by the West. Now, the third aspect is that Afghanistan seems to be motivated more by, at least the Taliban claims to be motivated by religion. So... We could say the administrative aspect, the law and order aspect, and the religious aspect. So, okay, so as far as far as, far as the uh, the law and order aspect, um, under the American supervision, the so-called democratic Afghanistan was disgustingly corrupt. And so, to say that the Afghan people had justice under these democratic leaders or that Afghanistan would necessarily be a better place with democracy. I don't know. I, I don't say it's better under the Taliban. That's not my point. Hmm. But uh, trying to impose, I mean, democracy works in certain places. It doesn't work so well. It doesn't work so well in Mexico. Mexico has an extremely high murder rate. It has an extremely high femicide rate. Killing women. Where? It's, uh, talk in, in Afghanistan. Mexico. Mexico. Oh, okay. So to say that, I mean, and 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 the corruption, political, you know, the corruption of the, the government uh, is legendary. So to say that Mexico is absolutely better off with the extremely corrupt, extremely dangerous. Uh, government, that, you know, society they live in, maybe. But but what I, to me, it's not ideological. To me, it is, if you've really studied history, if you really know what you're talking about, and you can present, you know, not ideology or trying to, you know, confirmation bias, trying to bend all the facts so they fit your ideology. So this idea that somehow, I mean, I mean if you look at the Western world, Democracy works well, apparently, in some places, not so much in other places. It tends to work well where you have a relatively high level of public education. Yes. And it tends to work very poorly when you don't have that. So that's why in America, the founding fathers, one of the first things they did after they kind of got the country going you know, within 10 years or so, they started these land grant universities, you know, these state universities, because they knew that unless people are educated, democracy won't work. And in a sense, in America, it's not working so well, because there are just too many ignorant, foolish people who vote. Yes. And so, so the idea that ignorant, foolish people that don't know what the hell's going on, they have no idea about international affairs, they have no idea about how complicated large scale economies work and they're just going to vote. So the idea that because knowledge is like a pyramid, I'm not saying we should get rid of all the democracies. Uh, I'm just saying, though, let's be honest, that uh, knowledge, education is like a pyramid. People who are very highly educated are, are a very small number. And then as you go down, less educated, less educated, you get more people. So, so basically, democracy means the most ignorant people make the most important decisions. 
Oh, okay. That's why sometimes devotees rephrase that democracy is a government by the Shudra, of the Shudras, for the Shudras, by the Shudras, instead of of yes, the people. But, I mean, but, then, yeah. but then again, it's Kali Yuga. So what, I mean, you can, you can take any form of government you want, tyranny, democracy, you know, constitutional monarchy, absolute monarchy, oligarchy, you name it. And we can see examples where it worked well and examples where it was a disaster. Hmm. And so, you know, Hitler took power in a democratic Germany. So it's, um, and Mussolini, I think, won some elections too. So it's systems don't make good societies. Good people make good okay. societies. And, and, and so there's no system, there's no political system ever conceived that has not, at times, fallen into the wrong hands and been weaponized as, as, as a way to oppress and torture and, you know, oppress, suppress. It's done evil things. So power has been used, you know, you, you take power and you put a label on it like, okay, dem democracy or monarchy or this or that. And power corrupts and people in every system known have used, leaders have used that power to cause horrible suffering. Horrible, horrible suffering. Loss of life. So therefore, I don't know, I've come to a point in my life where I don't have so much faith in systems. I mean, there, I mean, in America, there's just incredible corruption. I just drove today from uh, sort of the far eastern end of the state of Colorado into Denver area. And uh, yesterday, I drove from Kansas into Colorado. And as soon as I went from Kansas to Colorado, the roads were terrible. And so, you know, there, 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 there's a major, of course, they got better as I got closer to Denver, but there, there, there are major infrastructure problems in America. I mean, there are major, so many problems in America and so many problems in other countries, and yet so much money is wasted. Just an obscene amount of money is wasted mm -hmm. and, and pilfered. And, you know, you have the richest people not paying taxes, all kinds of just grotesque, obscene corruption. Mm -hmm. and, and that's in America, which is not the worst country in terms of its political transparency. There are better countries in America in terms of having honest government, and there are far worse countries. So I am not convinced yet that democracies, um, I don't know. I, I think unless there's a Krishna conscious revolution, Unless people really become God conscious, I don't think a political system will save the world. Yes, Maharaj, that's quite true. One more point about democracy. What you're saying is that it seems that when, when we emphasize democracy, it also leads to the excessive politicalization of society, that people become identified by their political orientations, and then debates can also become too much. Prabhupada mentioned yeah. a lecture in the past that that when one king would conquer another kingdom, the ordinary citizens, there would be hardly any difference. That these, yes. these, these soldiers went here and, okay, now this person is our king. We have to pay taxes over here. So in one sense, people's life... Well, but, that, but, that that is, but that's because of the mode of passion. Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 18, 20 through 22, 30 through 32, about jnana and the modes of nature and... and um, Buddhi. of nature. Buddhi, and yeah. so yeah, when people are just like nowadays, this, this incredible proliferation of pornography and, and even soft porn that's used to sell products. And I mean, it's um, and, 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 and meat eating. So there's so much passion. There's so much passion that people in the mode of passion just want to go out and kill each other. And oh, so okay. if, if there's, if there's an increase, dramatic increase in the, uh, polarization of society and and just public discourse has become more and more polemical and just vulgar and hateful um i think that it, 
it's a natural outcome of a society which has forgotten the mode of goodness mm. and now glorifies passion. Like they, they have like these in, incredibly vulgar expressions. Like they say a particular person is hot, which means that that person somehow has the ability to arouse uh, or, or to agitate other people's reproductive organs. And so, I mean, it's so gross. It's so disgusting. It's not that this person is virtuous or this person is wise or learned. They're hot. And, and the media, of course, they're complete prostitutes. They're, they're just, you know, street walkers from the word go. And they, um, you know, whatever sells. You know, they, oh, they, they have knocked all the most vulgar life. Yeah, it's just... Because, and so really, I, I think what's really the question here is that what is the, um, it, it, it's sort of a referendum on secularism. I mean, I certainly, okay. believe, I, I certainly believe in freedom of religion. And, okay. but again, America started a time just after the Revolutionary War when uh, around the year 1800, which was, you know, right, th there was this, what they called, the, you know, the Great Awakening, people just like this, re this fanatical religion, and we have to serve God, and we have to obey God. And, and so when you have a society that's almost, you know, that's religious, sometimes almost too much, when you have a society like that, then, you know, you need, sec you need the idea of imposing a secular state. I know, for example, uh, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, Benjamin Franklin, the University of Pennsylvania, one an official Ivy League school, the other what they call a public Ivy, you know, two of the world's great universities. And both of them sort of established that, you know, over my dead body, this is going to be a Christian school. Because I, th I think we have to look at the, the secular, the movement to secularize society including just, just you know, uh, anecdotal evidence, uh, anecdotal examples of Jefferson and mm -hmm. Franklin with their respective universities, because there was so much fanaticism going on. And because in Europe, everyone was very conscious that Europe had gone through this, this uh, diabolical orgy of violence over religion, you know, Protestant Catholic wars, and just the most horrible, horrible violence. And God only knows how many people were killed and tortured, slaughtered. And so therefore, you have people coming to America saying, okay, we're going to serve God, but we don't want a state religion. We don't want that kind of fanaticism. Mm -hmm. But taking, but then you see over time, they took secularism to a, to a, to a level beyond anything the founding fathers could have imagined. And so it's one thing when you have a basically religious population and just to keep everyone from attacking everyone else, it's secular. There's no state religion. Separation of church and state did not mean a separation of, of country and God. It meant there's no state church because every country in Europe had a state church. Okay. So, so there. Yeah. yeah, but 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 just just to wrap this yeah. up, and then I'll turn it over to you. And so it's gone, but now it's gone way beyond that. So secularism means that any vulgarity, any if you know, just offense against the sacred, anything is fine, because the state cannot even protect even the anything, and 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 so it's gone to the other extreme. Not, not, not an extreme of excessive religiosity producing wars and madness, but it's so much secularism, the, the, the collapse of any moral standards. And uh, so, so I think it, it, it's also a referendum on what kind of secularism do we want. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. This is very insightful. In one sense, secularism itself has, the idea has degenerated from neutrality toward religion to almost apathy or antipathy toward religion. So what you are talking about, if I understand is, there was opposition to one religion being imposed when America was founded, but underlying there was a acknowledgement that there are certain religious values which are universal and those need to be practiced. 
and it yes. seems that was also there in the mahabharat times because from what i have read i think uh, drupada was a shaivite king and uh, the pandavas were more vaishnavite but that was never a cause of dispute among them no i mean you could make an argument i'll try it out here and see what see how you can respond to it that india or bharat varsha to be more precise under the pandavas was to some extent a secular kingdom because okay. if if you look at the great state religious events such as say a rajasuya sacrifice or other the, the, the soma yagya which is basically the uh, subject of the vedas or the rig veda so i think you could argue that these great state events these great yagyas were not seen as religious because they were seen as simply complying with the laws of nature and the higher order uh you could say bureaucracy of the universe and so if you if and and, and so for example yudhisthira did not force everyone to become a vaishnava so even when krishna was established as the agrapurusha that did not necessarily reject all other systems of worship that might have no, been it, it, it was just a state honor oh okay it was a state honor like for example at the rajasuya sacrifice when shishupala both figuratively and, and and literally lost his head um perfect okay yeah krishna was declared to be simply the most honorable person it's like nowadays let's say for example uh you know who has a right to address the joint houses of congress the senate and the house of representatives and so it's an honor that's given for example very few leaders are invited foreign leaders are invited to address the the joint houses of congress it's a great honor but it's not religious and so krishna people were simply saying that krishna is the greatest person in terms of his you know measurable power and is so if you understand that the vedas the sacrifices are simply um responding to and dealing with the objective laws of nature then okay. it it's not i mean in what sense is it religious again there were no there wasn't like a vaishnav church back then it's not that okay everyone has to join the vaishnav church or for example even later when buddhism was spreading in jainism in, in indian you see like in kashmir many other places it, it, if a buddhist king took over then okay it's a buddhist kingdom now so if a buddhist king took over but it's but did mean everyone had to become a buddhist it wasn't forced conversion okay. and so obviously you could say ancient bharata was not secular exactly in the sense that modern states are but in some senses they were they, so there was were... some state patronage of a particular religion so for example we have the rajput kings when they become came gaudiya vaishnavas during post chaitanya mahaprabhu's time they funded or promoted the govinda <laughs> temple instead of the ram temple yes. but yes. that was but not that's, that, that was... that's also but that's also much much later in history yeah because you actually don't find temples very much in the mahabharata Yeah, that is true. For example, in the Chaita and the Cherry Tamri, there are explicit descriptions like the Gundicha Temple or the Jagannath Temple. There aren't. You don't find major events taking place in temples. People go to shrines, which could just be a little like, for example, Rukmini went to offer her respects to the to to the goddess mm. before her wedding. but it's not described as as a big building what are the i'll tell you you know the big buildings there are certain places in the mahabharata that are explicitly described as big buildings and basically there are two or or maybe three categories there's there's palaces residential areas like in dwarka and asnapur and so people had beautiful homes 
which are described they're described as very opulent there were uh you could say almost like legislative assemblies a bit like the like in in the in Dwarka, it was called the Sudarma Hall. Mm. And and the and the Pandavas, I forget the name, but they had their so there were great halls for uh basically for you know the, the elders, the seniors, the power people gathering. There were um there were palaces for kings. So kings had palaces, other very prominent people, usually royalty had you know their own beautiful mansions and then you had assembly halls but what you don't so, so what i'm saying is there are explicit descriptions of magnificent buildings in shastra but never a description of a great building which is a religious center that's striking as you're telling this maharaj it struck me that when we talk about lord chaitanya mahaprabhu's pilgrimage it's primarily he's going to holy places and visiting deities. But if we talk about Ram's journey during his exile or even Pandava's journey, it's primarily meeting sages. It is not like visiting temples. No. Meet, Ram meets August, Agastya and he meets Sharabhanga and like that. Or, or even Vidura, Vidura or Balaram's pilgrimage. Oh, yes. If you look at Vidura's pilgrimage, Balaram's pilgrimage, uh, Arjuna's pilgrimage when he, you know, when he has to leave for a year, he has to leave because he entered upon Yudhisthira and uh, Draupadi. Hmm. So we, we have descriptions of pilgrimages to holy place, but not once in any of these Balaram's pilgrimage, Arjuna's pilgrimage, Vidura's pilgrimage. We never hear about them visiting a big building. Now, if you look at Lord Chaitanya's pilgrimage in South India, he's going, you know, we, there's, you know, Ranganath, there's, there, there's magnificent South Indian temples. And then uh, under Lord Chaitanya's authority, uh, the six Goswamis built beautiful temples, Mandirs and Vrindavan. I mean, the Kusum Sarovar, which is, I think, the most beautiful swimming pool in the, on, on earth. And so this type of monumental architecture, you know, the magnificent temples in South India and all over South India. And so, but none of that, none of that is described 5,000 years ago. <laughs> so therefore, I'm saying in some ways, not in every way, you could argue that Yudhisthira had a secular kingdom okay. in some ways. Not every way, but in some ways. So here we are using secular in the sense that the state does not promote any particular religion or oppose any particular religion. When the state intervenes, it is primarily because a person is or a particular king is disrupting the law and order. So for example, yes. when Jarasandha is attacked, it is not because he's worshipping Shiva, but because he is slaughtering kings in a sacrifice Supposed yes. to be for Shiva. Yes. So, for example, when Yudhisthira becomes king, I don't recall, and you probably know it better than me, I don't recall any way in which Yudhisthira specifically uh, tried to impose Vaishnavism in the kingdom. I mean, clearly he worshipped Krishna. And, and everyone in his kingdom, you know, Krishna would travel or come to the capital and everyone would honor him and, 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 and in, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. and, and he had, obviously, Krishna had extraordinary influence in those kingdoms where the kings were Vaishnavas. But in terms of state ceremonies, state edicts that were specifically aimed at converting people to Vaishnavism, it's never talked about. You know, we, do, we don't have, you know, we have limited information about the reign of Yudhisthira because uh, it comes, you know, toward the end of things, at least in the Bhagavatam. And, but huh. it just never describes Yudhisthira engaged in explicitly missionary work or government programs to promote Vaishnavism. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe you could say, okay, he did this, and that amounts to doing that, but yeah, it's um, yeah, in India, often the 
term Ramaraja is used to invoke vir- idea of virtuous rule. But if we look at the descriptions of Ramaraja, it is not that everybody was worshipping Ram. It is more that everybody had their needs taken care of. Everybody lived for a long time. There were no premature deaths. There were no natural calamities. I mean, Yudhishthira's rule, it harkens back to what you said earlier, that the yajnas, or the, the state religious events, were more were not so much uh, religious as they were harmonizing with the laws of nature. And, you know, and, they, and, and they had sometimes very heavy political consequences, like, for example, the Rajasuya. The, I mean, Krishna was picked to get the first honor but Rajasuya is not a Vaishnav a sacrifice. It's a Vedic okay. sacrifice. Okay. It's not, it's a Vedic sacrifice. Well, of course, Yagya Vai Vishnu, all the sacrifices ultimately are to Vishnu, and which is true. So in that sense, okay. you could say it's Vaishnava, but but not explicitly. I mean, it's not. It, it is and it isn't. Again, I don't want to go too far to one side or the other because. I wrote about this in my dissertation at Harvard that um, that in the Vedas themselves you find these statements that Vishnu is a sacrifice and ultimately ultimately it's about Vishnu but but not not so much in an explicit bhakti sense it's not like we go out and preach if you look at the hymns that you chant the Rig Veda if you look at the hymns that are chanted at, at, at Vedic sacrifices. Vishnu is mentioned. Vishnu is, Vishnu is mentioned in a very special way, such as in that verse, Tad Vishnu Paramang Padang Sada Pashanti Suraya, yeah. that the godly people are always looking toward that supreme abode of Vishnu. But even the Rig Veda, I mean, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, here's the proof Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Veda Vadarata Partha, Krishna criticizes those who just get into the language of the Vedas. Yayamang Pusmi Thambacham, the flowery words of the Vedas. And Krishna tells Arjun that Trigunya uh, Vishaya Veda, that the, the, the Vedas are concerned with the three modes of nature and how to prosper in these modes. And therefore, Nis Trigunya Bhavarjuna uh, go beyond the three modes, which means goes beyond go beyond the Vedas. Krishna talks about in chapter nine that Trividya uh, Soma Pa Puta Pa Pa. That those who are engaged with the three Vedas and or somapa drink the soma, which comes from the great Rig Veda soma sacrifice, and puta papa and are, are purified of their sins, swargatim prartiyante, because they aspire to go to the material heaven. Te punya masadya surrender lokam, having reached the pious world of Indra, te punya surrender lokam. Uh, uh, yeah, Ashnanti Divyan, they enjoy you know the pleasures of the gods, but then Chine Punye Marke Lokam Bishanti. Tetang Bhutwa Swarga Lokam Bishalam. Having thus experienced the vast resources of Swarga Bishala. Uh Tetang Bhutwa Swarga Lokam Bishalam. Chine Punye. That party is exhausted. It's like you know, you save your money, you work hard, you go on a trip, you go to some beautiful place, you know, you spend all your money and you go home. So, Kshine Punye, when the piety is exhausted, so us, Kshine Punye, Marti Lokum Bishanti, you come back to the world of where you die very soon. Marti Lokum. So uh, and then so by all this Vedic stuff that you gatangatang kama kama alabante. And and so Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, most of what he says about the Vedas is negative. Hmm. So we could so, say that uh, the Vedas re- Vedas refer more to ritualism or material religiosity. And uh, uh, what Krishna is talking more about is uh, spiritual values or spiritual purpose yeah. of life. But therefore, when we say Vedic civilization, the word Veda comes from the word Veda, and the Vedas are, you know, they're problematic. Yes, on the one true. hand, yeah. So that's a whole big discussion we could have. But yeah. uh, Maharaj, you had mentioned that you'd prefer to have a one-hour discussion and we'll continue. Yes, yeah, yeah, Miss May will wrap this up anyway. Yeah. I, I really so I, I would just it. like, if you don't mind. 
I, you, I mentioned uh, that you you mentioned one point. Maybe that could be the focus of our discussion tomorrow. That you that there is like at the founding of America, there was respect for religious values. We could use the word religious or spiritual values, uh, but without imposition of a particular particular system of worship or a particular religious denomination. And that seems to also have been there in in Yudhishthira's role or reign or also in the broad Indian history. But yes, they, therefore it, I said yeah. in some ways, not in all ways. Of course, yeah. In some ways, yeah. Vedic culture also respected a certain, a certain type of secularism. Yes, Maharaj. So uh, maybe tomorrow we could discuss about, say, the, uh, the Taliban itself claims to be a religious organization. They claim to be teaching uh, or even... Uh, they they claim to be following Islam very strictly, but in one sense, how the challenge would be: how do we foster values conducive toward God consciousness? Yeah, without imposing I, a particular I, 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 the idea, the idea of holy war that that you kill other people because they won't accept your religion that is demonic. That is a surah above. Oh, that's a surah above. Okay, and that's a quite a. A radical declaration. So in that sense, we cannot really call the Mahabharata war or the Ramayana war as a holy war in that sense. It's more of a law and order kind of dharma. thing. It's dharma. No, it, what it is, is right in the first verse of the Gita, dharma kshetra. It's a, it's a dharma yuta. Okay. It's, it's a war. It's, it's fighting for justice and for the rule of dharma, not the rule of human appetites and lust and greed, but the rule of dharma. Which the which Dhritarashtra and his sons violated. Yes, Maharaj. So, so, so yes, yeah, so when 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 the Pandavas and, and Krishna were negotiating with the Kurus trying to avoid the war, they didn't say that, okay, we can avoid this war if you all become Vaishnavas and put on Tila. That wasn't the point. They said we can avoid this war if you follow the law. Amazing point, yes, Maharaj. So, uh, yeah, maybe we could explore this. I don't want to hold you too much. Maybe explore this tomorrow. Yeah. If I can quickly summarize what we discussed today. So, we, if you don't do two minutes, two, three minutes. Yes. So, basically, we try to gain a dharmic perspective or whatever word you use, dharmic ved, perspective, Vedic perspective on the current Taliban, the Afghanistan issue, basically. So, we discussed two main points today. One was in terms of punitive purpose. Yes, if a, if a particular state attacks another state and uh, creates disruption, that has to be punished. That has to be uh, disciplined, regulated. But how it is to be done, so the major topic we discussed was democracy. Is democracy the way to prosperity? That's, that's like an unspoken or almost unquestioned dogma in today's world. But you gave historical examples of how even in the founding of America, what shape, the, what shape of or what shape or size of a political entity would be having legitimacy. That has been historically a big, there has been a lot of flux and uh, discussion on that, right? From the city states, which were then in Greece, to, to the way Romans removed the city states. And India was more like an empire. So you talk about the difference between confederation and confederation. And Indians seem to be somewhere in between during Yudhishthira's kingdom. So the point was that there was dharma. We, if we translate dharma as justice rather than as religion, then the king's duty was more to establish justice. It was not to impose any particular religion. And although there were rites which may consider religious, like the fire sacrifices, the yajnas, but they were more for harmonizing with natural laws and higher order bureaucracy rather than, say, forcing people to convert to a particular faith. And even Krishna is being accepted as a Parampur, as the Agra, uh, the Agra Puja, that is more of a state honor rather than a spontaneous, uh, rather than an imposition of a state of a worship of a particular being. So, so secularism in that sense, the state not imposing any religion, we could say Yudhishthira's rule in some ways of secular. But today, secularism, which, which was originally started to avoid state uh, st violence, like mindless orgy of violence in the name of religion. But that secularism has gone to the opposite extreme where, where there is rampant materialism, the mode of passion and sensuality and all that. So then 
if the people are not having any satvik values then no form of government will actually be workable and you said that rather than focusing on systems that democracy will solve problems it is more that it is, any system can be weaponized by those in power to exploit others what is more important is that good 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 citizens have to be created and one aspect of creating good citizens is to is to have some level of god consciousness so how god consciousness could can be established without needing a theocracy maybe that is something which we could discuss in tomorrow session yes Would you like summarize you summarize my points much better than i could no mara you articulate i just try to speak thank <laughs> thank you very much maharaj look forward to our second session tomorrow thank you thank you very much hari krishna thank you so much.